Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the UK Stroke Assembly live and in your homes. It's week three of our six week programme. My name's Tony Banks. I'm head of conference and events at the Stroke Association, also really proud chair of the UK Stroke Assembly. As I say, it's week three of our six week programme. Usually we'd be meeting face to face in the summer, but because of the coronavirus crisis, we're bringing you these weekly webinars live in your own homes. You can catch up on the last two weeks, which have been fantastic. We've seen a great range of speakers so far. Week one was taking, sorry, week one was staying active and week two was taking action. Last week, we saw a session on how you can campaign from your living rooms. And also we saw the wonderful Sally B do a live cook along. You can catch all of those sessions on the Stroke Association's website at stroke.org.uk forward slash UKSA virtual. As always, we want you to have your say, so please do use the chat box to introduce yourselves, to say hi to others, and to post your questions to today's speaker. As always, we've got the wonderful Natalie with us, who will be monitoring your questions throughout. Good morning, Nat, how are you? Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, if you would like to post any comments or questions, um, at the right-hand side of your screen, you'll be able to see a comments box. If you scroll right to the bottom, you'll be able to post your comments in the text bar and submit using the little arrow key. Thanks, Natalie. So do post your questions throughout. And also, please let us know your feedback. At the end of each week, we'll send you an email uh, a chance for you to feedback your thoughts on these sessions. We want to hear what you'd like to hear more of in the future and tell us what you think about how these are run. And if you and if you do give us your feedback, you'll be entered into a free prize draw. So there's an incentive there for you too. If you're on social media, please use the hashtag stroke assembly and post about the sessions that you're joining. And please encourage others to join if you think they'd benefit from experiencing the stroke assembly live too. So on to this week, and the focus of this week is stroke research and its ability to prevent stroke, its ability to save lives, and how it enables stroke survivors to make the best possible recovery. So pleased today to welcome Dr. Neve Kennedy from Ulster University, who's going to be running a fantastic and fascinating session, which I know you're going to really enjoy. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Neve Kennedy and her session, Rewiring the Brain, New Connections and Recovery. Over to you, Neve. Hello, everybody. I'm so pleased to be with you here today. So today we're going to talk about rewiring the brain. So we're going to talk about can the brain rewire itself, how it rewires after stroke, the activities you can do to increase your brain plasticity, and we've time for any questions and comments at the end. So the topic we're really talking about today is neuroplasticity, a concept that some of you may have heard of and to others it will be new. There's been lots of research done into this area, but today I hope to give you a brief overview on how we can potentially rewire our brain with brain plasticity. For me, my interest in brain plasticity comes from personal experience. At age 14, I was faced with a CAT scan that looks like this. I was diagnosed with a type of brain tumour that meant I needed three rounds of neurosurgery, following which I had a stroke. I lost my speech and some of my movement. During this time, I became really fascinated by the brain's ability to repair I was conscious that I was getting better while plenty around me weren't and that I could see the real impact that treatment and rehabilitation was having in helping me gain back some of the abilities that I had lost. And this ultimately led me to a career investigating the role that the brain plays in recovery from damage or stroke and the really important role that brain plasticity may play in this. Okay, so what do we mean by neuroplasticity? Well, until recently, many people, including scientists, believed that our brains did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in the last few decades now tell us this isn't true, that our brains are constantly changing, that the brains can change 
and does change during our lifetime. Neuroplasticity or brain plasticity is the process by which the brain reorganizes and remodels itself throughout our life. Neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to rewire, create memories, learn new things and make new connections within the brain. So every time we learn a new fact or uh, master a new skill, you have potentially changed your brain through this process of brain plasticity. Brain plasticity occurs by strengthening existing connections, forming new connections and getting rid of connections we don't need. So the brain is constantly building and pruning its connections. Connections within the brain are becoming stronger or weaker depending on what is being used. With every repetition of thought, of skill, we are reinforcing a neural pathway. These small changes, frequently enough repeated, lead to bigger changes within our brain and how our brain works. So basically, neuroplasticity is like the muscle building part of our brains. The things that we, we do more often, we become stronger at. The things that we don't fade away and these pathways become weaker. We can increase our brain plasticity by intensively and repetitively practicing something. This is how we learn a new skill, even complicated things like learning how to ride a bike. With practice, the, our brains and our muscles, the connections between them become stronger and we become better at being able to do that. So over time, with practice, the pathways within the brain for those skills or functions, whether it be juggling, learning a musical instrument, learning a new language, or learning how to ride a bicycle, become stronger, and therefore we get better at the task. This practice also helps strengthen the connections between our brains and the rest of our body, all the rest of the muscles in and limbs in our body. So obviously our brains being plastic and giving us the opportunity to reorganize, rewire and remodel our brains is important for all of us. But there is key times in our lives when neuroplasticity is crucial. One of this, these times is during childhood when our brains are super plastic and we are little sponges for learning language, movement and new skills. The other time is after brain damage, such as a stroke, when brain plasticity may help us recover. After a stroke, certain parts of the brain can become damaged. This depends on the type of stroke you've had and where in the brain your stroke has occurred. The functions that were once stored in these parts of the brain, such as language or movement or thinking and memory, can become affected or impaired. For example, if the part of your brain responsible for movement and controlling the right side of your body becomes damaged, it can make it hard to move your right arm. And this is potentially where neuroplasticity can come into play. Neuroplasticity may allow your brain to rewire functions that were held in those damaged areas, such as language and movement, over to healthy parts of the brain that haven't been damaged by the stroke, or can help rewire connections around the damaged area to help maintain those functions. 
There has been lots of research into this area and there has been a lot of things that over years of rehabilitation and through research, we can see that have been demonstrated to increase brain activity, increase brain connectivity and potentially increase brain plasticity. I'm just going to take a moment to talk through a few of these. So we all know that exercise can have a very beneficial effect on your body, but it can also have a beneficial effect on your brain. This includes boosting brain chemicals that are associated with brain plasticity. Exercise doesn't have to just be hopping on a treadmill. It can be activities such as getting out and walking and gardening and basically uh, increasing your movement. Learning a new skill can also increase and strengthen the brain plasticity. And this strengthens connections between your brain and your muscles. Music has also been incorporated into stroke rehabilitation as it can increase activity and connectivity in your brain after stroke. It can also be used, like the beat of the mu music can be used to help pace um, relearning tasks such as walking. And that helps us find a natural rhythm to walk to. Visualization, including mental imagery or motor imagery, which is imagining a, a movement without actually doing it. This shows that this, even just imagining doing the movement can increase activity in the areas of the brain involved in the movement without actually moving the muscles. Social interaction, including spending time with friends and family, has been shown to induce plasticity related changes in your brain. Reading, mathematical and logical problems, crosswords, all these sorts of you know, puzzles can also increase brain activity and heighten connectivity within your brain. Things such as mindfulness and yoga have been shown to decrease stress, which is really important because it's shown that stress can reduce this brain reorganization, this plasticity. And also if the people out there who are feeling particularly ambitious, learning a new language has been shown to have beneficial effects on your brain. People who are bilingual have activity in parts of their brain that us individuals who only can speak single languages do not have, showing us that relearning and learning a task definitely changes how our brain works and looks. Now we know more about neuroplasticity through um, research, it might be a good time to just help address some of the brain and stroke recovery myths that are out there. When talking to stroke survivors, one of the things that I am told they have often been told is the level of impairment or the ability that you have at six months or a year is as good as you'll get. This is not the case. Although immediately after your stroke, your brain is at its most plastic and it's very prime for recovery. And that's why we start our physio and our OT and our rehabilitation during this time, because your brain is really ready for this and very prime for recovery. We now know that stroke survivors can continue to make improvement years and years after their stroke. That with concentrated effort and activity, a stroke survivor can help reorganize their brain long past six months or a year. So this is a myth that as we learn more about neuroplasticity and this research into this can help us dispel. Now, this is not just an excuse for me to put up a picture of the Giants Causeway from Northern Ireland, but also to talk about something I hear a lot from stroke survivors. I often hear from stroke survivors and clinicians talk about 
plateaus, about plateaus in their stroke recovery. It's important to remember that this is a normal aspect of any journey, whether it be recovering from a stroke, losing weight or training for a marathon. When we are learning new skills or increasing our neuroplasticity, there will be periods where we plateau. But just because we reach a plateau, that does not mean it's the summit. It does not mean it's the top and it does not mean you cannot move on from it. With focused activity, maybe resetting of goals or trying different exercises or skills or changing things up, it can introduce variety, which can help enhance brain plasticity. And this can help us move on from a plateau. So when thinking about making sure that we are utilising neuroplasticity in our stroke recovery journey, here is just a few things that we can keep in mind that come from what we have learnt about neuroplasticity. One of the key things in all aspects of our recovery is, think, is remembering that everybody's stroke is different, therefore everybody's recovery is different. And often comparison with other stroke survivors is not always helpful. Everybody may recover at different rates. So it's important that we focus on our own recovery journey so that we don't get disheartened by comparing ourselves to other people. Taking up a new skill or hobby, learning a new skill or hobby is really important we know repetition and practice and activating the connections between your brain and your muscles is beneficial. I have spoken to stroke survivors who have taken up painting or gardening and even one who took up Taekwondo. This not only helps us use parts of the body uh, affected by the stroke, for example, if uh, we get really bored uh, or uh, repeating a task such as reaching for a cup to help strengthen our, um, our arm muscles after a stroke, doing gardening or painting might be a more interesting, challenging way of, of getting the same movement into our recovery. So it helps us use parts of the body affected by the stroke but also the brain likes learning new things. And this learning can help facilitate reorganization within our brain. And this reorganization and plasticity helps recover some of the function in, um, in our brains. We know that social interaction and a stimulating environment can help increase brain activity. Particularly, this is difficult at the minute because we can't be out seeing people in the same ways as we would normally. But things like getting involved in online and in, in making sure that your social interactions in, uh, stay um, around, that you're still doing things, helps us not only with our mood or our, our motivation, but it also our brain is a social thing. It likes to the interactions with other people. So you could join a stroke, stroke group or another social group, or even if you don't want to, you could volunteer or have a regular catch up with our friends. That this is really important, this social interaction and our, our in, interesting environments is important for our, keep our brains reorganizing. We know that stroke recovery is hard work. And with any journey, it's important to break it down into smaller goals. So sometimes setting a smart goal, a specific measurable goal, um, we can use this to help uh, make improvements. It's often difficult to see our own progress, but goal setting can help with this. There is also lots of evidence-based rehabilitation techniques that you will have done with your OT, your speech and language therapist and your physio during your rehabilitation 
that can also be implemented later on in your stroke journey, such as task training, strength training, exercise, mental imagery. Just because we're out of um, our physio or out of our rehabilitation inpatient or outpatient doesn't mean that we can't incorporate some of those techniques that we know work and are important into our day-to-day -day lives. Okay, so what is this research telling us about neuroplasticity and how can we incorporate this? Well, something you may have heard physios say, what we know is use it or lose it. The, the skills we don't practice get weaker. Our brain likes to strengthen the pathways between our brain and between our brain and the rest of our muscles. So if you think about what I said about strengthening pathways and weakening, weakening pathways that we don't use and that our brain likes to prune our connections, it's important that we need to practice the skills that we want to be able to use. So as a result, repetition matters. We must do a task over and over again to actually change the brain. And that's why um, during rehabilitation and afterwards, like anything, if we want to get good at any skill, we need to practice it. And the same goes in our stroke recovery journey. Also, the intensity matters. You know, like anything, if you want to get good at something, more repetition in a shorter period of time is important for creating new connections. We all know that fatigue after stroke is a big issue and we have to work within our own um, you know, abilities. But it's important that we know stroke recovery is hard work and that we put the effort into this by ensuring that we have lots of repetition and that we have a good level of intensity, that we are pushing ourselves to try and facilitate and increase this brain plasticity. So obviously, I think uh, that brain plasticity is a really important aspect of stroke recovery. But it's also important to remember that neuroplasticity is not a miracle worker. If it was, everybody would make a full recovery from stroke, which we know is not always the case. But this is a natural process that's going on inside our brains that we can help enhance and capitalize on within its limits. We want to try and encourage our brain to use this and to use this brain plasticity to help on our rehabilitation and recovery journey. So in conclusion, the ability for our brains to change, adapt, remodel throughout our lifetime is great news for all of us. There is some key things that we can do to help facilitate and enhance this neuroplasticity. I hope the research in this field continues to learn more and more about how neuroplasticity works so we can gain insights how, the, how it affects different people. And the more that we understand about neuroplasticity, ultimately we can ensure that we utilise this process for the best outcomes for every stroke survivor. Thank you very much. And now Tony and Natalie and I are happy to take questions and comments. Neve, thank you so much. Uh, absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, Natalie, I can see it's been really busy on the chat box and we've had lots of questions and comments, I think, haven't we? We have indeed. So thank you everyone for sharing your experiences today. Uh, I will just read a few comments um, as I've been going through. So particularly from Ruth and Ellie. So Ruth saying, I am nearly four years post-stroke and still improving. Um, another positive one from Ellie saying, I totally agree. I took up going back to work. It's actually helped me be more independent and I feel more on my feet than I realised. So there's some really inspiring comments there. Um, that's, do you really, have that's really interesting. That's like neuroplasticity in action. You know, it's really, and I think that sometimes it's only when we begin to, 
that for somebody like that four years post stroke that when you do your next challenge or like going back to work or something else that you your brain reorganizes again and you're enhancing that neuroplasticity Thank you, Neve. I do have a few more questions, if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. So I've got one in particular that says, do you think neuroplasticity would work if spasticity is a factor in the muscles? And how would you suggest certain exercises? Well, I think that neuropla neuroplasticity is obviously working in the brain and the connections between the brain and the muscle. And spasticity um, and neuroplasticity, there may be some interaction, but just because there is some spasticity doesn't mean that there were, that you don't have the potential to utilize and use neuroplasticity. I think that everybody has to work within, you know, their particular requirements, such as with spasticity, that it may be that high repetition of a certain muscle uh, movement mightn't be as useful, but it might be strengthening and doing stuff with muscles around it. But uh, physios are the best person to talk to about spasticity and particular exercises, but I wouldn't want people who are who have spasticity be put off or think that neuroplasticity won't apply to them it still will thank you Neve. um there's a few other questions we've had around sort of memory exercises mm -hmm. and whether puzzles and sort of online apps and games um might help help that process Yes, and there's a lot of stuff about brain training and things like that. And there isn't a strong evidence base for the brain training apps. But what we do know that is engaging your brain through things like puzzles and doing um, keeping your brain active. We know that we have to keep our bodies active. We've been told for years that if you want to stay fit, fit and healthy, you need to keep your body active. It's the same for your brain. And one a really good way of doing that is through puzzles, crosswords, um, you know, testing your memory. Our brains, if you think about those pathways and use, use it or lose it, we want to keep our brain, all those pathways, as active as possible. We don't want our brain to say, oh, that's not as important a pathway. I'll let that sort of fade away. And what? And for our memory, we can continue to sort of train that like a muscle that we are using it all the time. So I would really recommend keeping your brain active. And if a good way that you enjoy doing that is crosswords or puzzles or memory tasks, that's, that's fantastic. That's worth doing. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, another question here. So um, how far away are we until we see some new medicine techniques to help stroke survivors, for example, stem cell technology? Well, the good thing is that there is a really, really vibrant stroke research community, a lot of it funded and supported through the Stroke Association. But every year at the UK Stroke Forum, the UK stroke researchers and people from all around the world get together to talk about the new initiatives. And it is fascinating how far and how, how many things are in the early stages of development. So there is things about looking, at, there's been a lot of work trying to find a pharmaceutical, a drug that could help enhance neuroplasticity. I've done some work about looking at brain stimulation and neuroplasticity to try and look at thing, ways we can boost neuroplasticity um, you know, through stimulation and through other things. Stem cells um, are really interesting. And despite sometimes what we might read in the media or we hear about, they are very much in their infancy, that, um, that they are still being developed. But the, we know that stroke can cause damage to different parts of the brain. And if stem cells potentially one day may be able to help us go to the source of the problem, to the damaged neurons, the damaged uh, brain cells, but that is further down the line. But I would like to say that even though stem cells might be further down the line, there is huge amounts of really interesting research coming out, not just about neuro. Uh, you know, about neuroplasticity, but also about stroke rehabilitation techniques and about preventing second strokes and things like that. And a lot of these have already made it into clinical practice. So there is a good pipeline of research and basic research 
going into helping stroke survivors on the ground. Thank you. I think that's all the time we've got for questions at the moment. But um, what I will do is I will make a note of all your questions that have been commenting today. So thank you for your input on those. And, and we'll share them in our inbox and hopefully we can get some responses for you afterwards. Um, so thank you, everyone, for today. Yeah, huge thank you, everyone. Eve, I think this is a topic people are very, very interested in. And clearly we could talk for a lot longer if we did have the time. But thank you so much. If, if people want to find out more about this topic or if there's more information that they can access, is there somewhere they can go? Uh, yes, uh, the neuroplasticity is on the Stroke Association website and I'm happy to share some other links if people want to, to find out even more. Thank you. I think we're just posting the, the link to our website at the moment. So if people are looking to find out more, please do check out the information online. But for now, Neve, thanks so much for such a fascinating talk today. It's been really nice to have you with us at the Stroke Assembly. Hopefully we'll have you back again another time soon. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed being here and I hope to see you all again soon. Take care. Thank you. So that wraps up today's session. I hope you've enjoyed it. We continue with our focus on research this week. And on Wednesday at 11 a.m., you can join Helen Morse, a Stroke Association funded researcher, He's going to be talking about vision loss after stroke. So please do join us for that session on Wednesday. On Friday, you can participate in a live question and answer session with the Stroke Association's very own research team. This is a sign up that you'll need to, to join online and it's a limited number of people that can join this. So if you want to participate in that discussion, we'll post the link and you can sign up for that now. Places are filling up fast, so do get involved with that one too. And before we finish today, I just want to make a big announcement for next week's series of webinars. We've got a fantastic session we're going to be running on Wednesday, sorry, Monday night next, next week with Chris Tarrant, the one and only Chris Tarrant from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. He's going to be running a virtual pub quiz with the Stroke Association. You can sign up for that pub quiz right now on our website. We're posting the link below. So get your teams together and join the Stroke Association's very first ever virtual quiz with Chris Tarrant, Stroke Survivor and Stroke Association Ambassador. We're really looking forward to that one too. That's all the time we've got today. I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll see you on Wednesday with Helen Morse, but for now, goodbye. <laughs>